and antidotes for myriad ways that our mind can trick us. Uh, trick us into feeling separate and alone. Trick us into feeling as though we are on stage and everyone is watching and there's a big show. And that idea of our separate important self is so painful. And we can know that, we can have a conscious sense that that's true. But what's so powerful about these slogans is they're such an interesting technology. They're a technology of kind of provocations. And of course, they're just words, uh, they're just sentences. But the way that we will engage with them is using them as though they were a key to unlock a really deep understanding about our heart and mind. So, of course, we will be saying them, as in repeating them, but the way we will engage with these words is, gosh, it's just, it's actually honoring language. It's honoring the power of language that, of course, language is how many of us experience ourselves. We operate and move through the world with words. We think about this, I have to go to the grocery store. I need to check the surf report. Uh, if you are Jenny, Dahl, or myself, um, and if Brandon's on the call, instead of, you know, a kind of uh, the feeling that is right underneath those words. So when we start thinking about the power of thought. It's not just that it helps us move through the world. <clears throat> it actually shapes what we believe about the world, our perceptions and our ideas. And um, in each of these slogans, it feels a bit cryptic. Uh, it feels a bit as though we really have to uh, kind of open and pull apart the meaning. And then the language, because it's so simple, they're literally called slogans, right? Propaganda, that the words themselves we can turn over in our mind. And we will use a couple slogans, a couple of these Lojong slogans each week. And then we have that full amount of a time to reflect on them. Um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited. And with these slogans, you know, it's really the, the pith essence of the slogans. There's seven points of this mind training, which in classic Tibetan Buddhism, you're like seven. Oh my God, I could probably memorize that. Not so quick. Seven points underneath which there are 59 slogans. <laughs> so the list nested in the list, nested in the list. Um, so tonight we'll take the first point of this mind training. And this first point, if, I don't know, I hope this resonates with you all, but this first one is really training in the preliminaries. And to me, that feels like such a relief and a homecoming. Not preliminaries as in basic, not preliminaries as in um, without profundity, but preliminaries as, let's go back to the roots. Let's go back actually to how we practice Dharma. So this first set of slogans really helps us return to that, that core aspect of preparing ourselves to receive the Dharma. What is actually the way that we want to see the world? What is the way we want to perceive the world that is most suitable for these teachings and for the journey it brings us upon? So in honor of the fact that we'll be doing these preliminaries tonight, um, we'll actually start with a, a very preliminary practice, one of settling our body, our speech, and our mind, and one in which we are going to apply shamatha, or attention, to the mind itself. Before we begin our practice, I want to just again welcome you all, and um, yeah, share a great feeling of delight to be with you all in community this evening. And there's just so much work all of us are doing internally, individually, collectively, and I'm really grateful we can be together. And as many of you know, <clears throat> we are the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Even if it's your first night, you are the San Francisco Dharma Collective. It is a volunteer-run organization. Um, and that means that when we come together, we come together in this beautiful way <clears throat> to experiment community. And more and more, this experiment of the San Francisco Dharma Collective is really rising up to meet the time, rising up to meet the needs of this planet, of this country, uh, and as well as our smaller community. And we hold some values really dear. 
And the values that we hold dear is mutual respect and understanding. That's a really high value. I know we could have a whole class training in just that, but I wanna put forth these aspirations <clears throat> for our collective time together of really having a sense of not harming and really endeavoring to imagine as though in your mind, in your speech, everything could be coded with kindness. And we could just withhold reactivity and judgment for a bit of time here together. And that we really feel as though this opportunity together is a huge gift. That is a lot of what the Lojong will be teaching us tonight in these preliminaries is how we kind of treasure this moment of learning the Dharma together. But as we enter into this practice, remembering that we are so fortunate and this is so exciting. So not just, oh yeah, God, I, yeah, I committed to Wednesday night, so I guess I'm here. Um, but like the joyful enthusiasm, like we get to spend this time together. We get to look at this text. It is so awesome. So compassion, non-harming and joyful enthusiasm. That is what I am inviting us all together. And really also wanting to um, recognize that we are a learning community of being online. And if there is um, things that come up in different ways that we are speaking or different ways that we're presenting material that make anyone here feel uncomfortable, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I know it's hard during the course to maybe say something, but um, we are so eager to learn of how to be supportive and how to be um, a collective in which we can have a sense of mutual respect and safety and understanding. That's our greatest hope. I see a lot of Dharma Collective board members, volunteers here, and um, yeah, we're, we're so happy to have you. We're so happy to be together. So with that, ah, oh, let's practice. So I invite you <clears throat> to find a comfortable position, one that supports both a sense of relaxation and ease, a feeling of softening through the entire front of the body. While also inviting a quality of a dignity and integrity. As though this meditation was similar to sitting down upon a throne. That sense of dignity that sense of integrity and responsibility. So an uprightness from the spine and a softness and ease through the front of the body. Checking in briefly to the key points of our posture. Feeling a sense of comfort however our legs are folded or beneath us in the chair. Finding a place where our hands can rest easily, whether folded in the lap or resting on the thighs. Invite spaciousness and openness through the belly. Giving yourself freedom to release a belt buckle if anybody is still wearing belt buckles in these pandemic times. And invite an uprightness to the spine. Maybe shifting a little forward, shifting a little backwards, and really finding where it is that's centered. and inviting the gaze, even with eyes closed, to be soft. And inviting the chin to be gently resting, following the gaze, not slumping down, not falling back. And then invite the entire body, mind to turn inward, bringing the entire gaze towards one's inner experience.
Begin by settling the body into a natural state of stillness and relaxation. Feel the stability and support from beneath you, letting that allow the body to unwind any tension. For the moment, release vigilance, become soft, become still, supported at ease. Notice whatever can be noticed throughout the tactile sensations of the body as a way to help bring you into the body and invite this settling. Feel the sense of settling the body from within the body itself. And gently shift now to settling the speech. Not just the outer speech, which of course, when we are not saying anything is quite easy to do. Settling the inner speech, the narration and dialogue. And to help us settle the speech, we follow the natural rhythm of the breath. And then settling the mind in its natural state. Inviting these qualities of relaxation, vividness and clarity. Each moment, refreshing our interest in just this moment without grasping without distraction, without future, without past. And 
these simple instructions many of us have heard hundreds or thousands of times without grasping, without distraction, settling the mind into its natural state. And for a couple truly delicious moments, let's settle body, speech, and mind together. Stillness, solidity, stability of body. Softness, turning down the volume on inner speech. And mind, free from grasping and distraction. a letting go of each new thought that arises. Feel into each moment fully, body, speech, and mind. And from this place of having settled just a bit, we may be clearly aware of the contents of our mind and body, noticing what arises that is difficult, that is challenging, possibly that is pleasant and enjoyable. And from here in this introspection, Consider a meaningful intention for our practice tonight. A very personal intention, one that reflects where you are right now in this practice. And right where the space of intention has created a word or phrase, we'll direct our attention there. Softly having the eyes open just a bit. We move into our practice of settling the mind in its natural state. Having the eyes be completely soft, not focusing anywhere. Leaning back in the mind. Gently notice the thoughts, memories, images, and mental events as they arise.
without energizing, without engaging, without donating our attention to them. We use these thoughts that arise and pass away as the object or focus of our attention. Just as we might notice and use sound as the object of our attention. We don't analyze or inquire. We just notice the thought arising and the thought slipping away. If you notice you've been caught up in a thought, memory, or image, let your first response be to relax. Release whatever has captured your attention and then refresh your interest. In this practice, we consider the movement of thoughts existing and emerging from the stillness of our awareness as much as possible rest in that stillness of your awareness as the thoughts move, shift and change. If you become overwhelmed with thoughts or feel too distracted, no problem to close the eyes and return to noticing the natural rhythm of the breath for a couple moments and then return once again to noticing the movement of thoughts from the stillness of our awareness. If it's helpful, you can imagine your awareness is everywhere, not just behind your eyes, in between the ears, spacious and vast. The movement of thoughts can come and go in this huge spaciousness of your awareness. Even the briefest glimpse 
of the stillness of your awareness. It can be entirely refreshing, revitalizing. Do not give up hope. Keep refreshing your interest, keep releasing the thoughts, memories and images. Gently closing the eyes. Return your attention and awareness to the breath and body. Re-inhabit the full feeling sense of being in this breathing body. Thank you all for your practice. It was really nice to practice together. Before we move on to more practice, any questions on that practice or any reflections? That's um, for those of you who know Alan Wallace, I would say one of his most uh, common practices for shamatha, for training our attention, using the mind. I like how he sometimes says, you know, in some ways, if you can't beat them, join them. So many of our attention practices, we just try to get the thoughts out of the way. We try to, no, okay, I'm focusing on this. And instead, we open up and we use the thoughts as our practice of attention. And 
Um, yeah, I think it's a challenging practice. I like it because it's a lot like real life. <laughs> we have a lot of thoughts coming and going and sometimes they feel quite strong and sticky. Um, so practicing in this way to me feels like wonderful training. You are welcome to type a question into the chat or if you would like to raise your hand. Um, yeah. Any thoughts or reflections on practice? Yes, Claudia. Oh, can't hear you. Claudia, we can't hear you. Okay, so I guess my question was, in the first part of the practice, you kind of asked us to settle the, the speech, the body and mind, and so we were not supposed to have thoughts, or I mean, kind of like clear them and settle, right? But then after that, you said, well, if you have any thoughts, then go ahead and focus. And then it seemed like, at least in my experience, when you focused on them, then they would vanish. <laughs> right? It was interesting. Yes. Because it made me think about what you, um, when, when you, um, when we were studying uh, Rinpoche, Sokni Rinpoche, and he talked about the space and the, the yeah. clouds of thoughts and then the, the stillness of the sky, that the space that is always there, but then the clouds, the thoughts are moving, but then they just go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it is interesting, there, that is a pretty common phenomena that in this practice, all of the thoughts we thought were so occupying actually kind of get deflated. Um, and that's also nice to see that there is a space of consciousness without thought. Um, Mace and or Pamela said they enjoyed coming back to the feeling after having done the attention gathering with the thoughts. Okay, it was me. Oh. Um, yeah, I agree. There's, it's such an interesting, um, you know, our awareness, as I, I suggested, isn't just in our head. And yet when we're in awareness, it, it to me feels, at least in my experience, it's everywhere. And then to come back into the body, to me, it's like, oh, I'm home. It's such a sweet feeling. It's like uh, able to really um, appreciate that feeling of inhabiting the body fully. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on a little bit. Um, a, a bit about these Lojong. Uh, some of you probably actually uh, learned this with Chandra a couple of years ago. Um, the Lojong is a 10th century, is attributed as a 10th century text from Atisha, who's a wonderful beloved teacher, especially uh, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And you know, something interesting about these texts that I, I find to be meaningful right now is there's an emphasis that Atisha had to travel a very dangerous journey to learn this from another master. And um, this idea that in order for us to receive the teachings, maybe sometimes it's a dangerous journey. Uh, and that doesn't mean, you know, entering into the Zoom link. But I think for many of us, we didn't come to these teachings because life was so awesome. Um, and everything was going our way, and the material world was really showing up for us. So there's something, you know, we aren't crossing great seas um, in order to get these teachings, but there does seem to be, for many of us, um, the portal or entryway is, is wanting more well-being, which often means that there was some level of ill-being. Uh, so I, I really appreciated that idea of to receive the teachings, it's a journey or a voyage. And, you know, I, I again, like, wow, I just, when I think about the Lojong, I just think it's, it's so 
just so rich for this time um, to have this guidance and to have the guidance be pithy. So I don't know about you guys, I have, I would say at least 24 Dharma books I wish I was reading all the time. They just like stack higher and higher. And you know, when I do get the chance to read a couple chapters, it's so enriching. But the pace of this modern life or the pace that I have chosen in this modern life uh, means that these pithy slogans, they're very useful. I can absolutely take them to heart and, and make them alive for me week by week. Um, whereas sometimes those books, I have to wait until I have the amount of time to really engage. So I think that they're, they're really useful in that way. Um, and again, I, I like that they aren't um, simply a guided meditation, which I love guided meditation. Um, and yet with guided meditation, you know, as, as many of you know, we can inadvertently fall into a bit of, as Sokni Rinpoche would say, cozy dharma, right? Like, ah, yes, mm, I feel good in meditation. Oh, I'm so relieved after all the difficulties. This is great. And we might not be going into the root of our difficulties. And these slogans, they really provoke us. I mean, there's a couple in there that I can't even look at face on. I have to like look at them from the side. They're so challenging. Like really, like, oh God, I don't want to hear that. Um, and so I think it's a really good compliment to our daily practice to have these provocations. So some of you may know in the Zen tradition, there's kind of this bamboo stick. And um, with the bamboo stick, you're, you're expected to uh, be, the teacher notices when in your meditation, you're just actually spiritually bypassing or thinking about your groceries and they come and just ha, kind of hit you. Um, that's not done today, which is probably for the better for most of us. And, you know, most of us, unfortunately, don't have a relationship with a teacher who knows us well enough to point out what we're missing. And I find that these slogans, they are self-instructive. They empower us to look at where we are stuck. And fortunately, we get to do this together. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's a really useful complement to our daily practice and really helps us get underneath, again, some of the root causes of our suffering, some of the ways that we create division and separation. So the first um, point is training in the preliminaries. And I want us to take each one of these slowly and we're actually going to practice, meaning I will say it, and then I'm gonna invite us to truly reflect on it. And what does that mean? Does that mean we say it over and over in our head? Does that mean we kind of evoke an image? You know, it's interesting. I think, I think that for many of us, the words itself will be evocative enough. And for others, we might need to kind of come up with an idea or memory. So I'll give us a couple options. So the very first of these slogans is maintain an awareness of the preciousness of human life. So I'm gonna invite you to just close your eyes gently. And take a couple moments here to reflect on this beautiful invitation. This thing that we can remember and hold in our mind that can transform our mind just through its remembering. Maintain an awareness of the preciousness of human life. I'm going to share the second one, which is closely related. Be aware of the reality that life ends. Death and impermanence comes for everyone.
maintain an awareness of the preciousness of human life. Be aware of the reality that life ends, death and impermanence comes for everyone. And as we're reflecting on this, not just to be morbid, not to make us unhappy, reflecting on how this helps prepare us for what is a long journey of the Dharma. A couple more moments here, noticing what is being experienced as mental images or thoughts, what is being felt in the body, what might be felt at the level of subtle body. I would love to hear from one or two people on what that was like or what came up for you. Katie wrote such sweetness, remembering the preciousness of life. Peaceful, Heidi says, not worried or sad about death. And Diane says, gratitude and appreciation. Some of you may be familiar with Stephen Levine's book, One Year to Live, also a program taught by Vinnie Ferraro and many others. And a main premise of that book and of those teachings is to keep this in mind every day. And what a profound practice it is. It's, it's such a delicate one to hold. It's, it's as though our evolution made it really hard to remember this. If we had to keep it in mind, we might not kind of hang in there for the long-term goals that matter so much. And yet by avoiding it and denying it, we set ourselves up for chasing around things that really have no value and no importance. When I think about this, um, when I think about these first two, I think about this um, analogy of practicing as though your hair were on fire, practicing with the full reality of the preciousness of this life. And um, yeah, I think it's um, I think it's such a huge and beautiful realization that is unbelievable how easy it is to ignore on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, there's nothing that's more certain than, than death, <laughs> right? Well, and taxes, they say, but yeah, I, I, uh, I think it's actually easier to forget taxes. And just how easy it is to forget, how easy it is to uh, fall asleep into our habits, into our to-dos, and as we all know, um, even from a, even if you even if this is the first time you're engaging in any kind of uh, training or practice, it is it's hard, right? This um, this practice, this path is hard, 
And it's not a linear journey. It's not like, yeah, it's hard. And then it gets better and you're good. <laughs> like it's hard. And then it's great. And then it's hard again. And then it's so much harder. And then it's great. Like there's just so much as our insights kind of reveal deeper and deeper layers for us as we find practice times that are really conducive and practice times that are really challenging. So how do we commit? How do we get in there for this journey, right? When we could very easily avoid and deny the reality of these two things, which of course is uh, way preferable, if at all possible, way preferable. Um, so like arrows, ooh, I love that, like arrows directly to our present moment. Yeah, uh, Mace and or Pamela, tremendous care for my people who've recently lost loved ones and tremendous care for the people I love who are in my life, so much beauty. Yeah, yeah, I think there's, you know, it's interesting because these two are really pointing towards looking at your own uh, mortality, but of course it brings up those we've lost and how much we treasure those who are here. Noam is saying, noticing that the joy I have for those alive is similar to the joy I have for those who have died. Hmm, that's so beautiful. Walt says, more BLM thoughts re. Story from Aurora, Colorado, where a car of a black woman, mostly kids, 6, 14, 17, laid on the ground at gunpoint Sunday over erroneous Stalin car stop. Some lives all too often aren't precious. Too, too many. Oh, thank you, Walt. Yeah. Yeah. Just that actual dignity and right of having a precious human life. Yeah. Claudia, cherishing the few gatherings with close family members and dear friends. Lebanon, Yemen, Syria. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And I know this is and can be and should be heavy, but it's also so meaningful and so joyful. We hear together, right? We have this opportunity to really feel that preciousness, to not miss out and to realize what a value it is. Um, and as Walt points out, what a privilege it is to have a precious human life that we can care for. And we, know, we don't quite know, um, some of us to different degrees than other, just how much capacity or control we have over it. So we're going to move on to the next slogan here. Any other thoughts or reflections on these first two, these preliminaries? I mean, this to me feels like final exam, not preliminary. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I've been deeply meditating on both of these as I lost a dear person in my life just a week ago. And it's, um, it's so rich for me and such a joy to share it with you all. Because you really, for me at least, the opening that happens with loss is so profound. There's no greater teaching. And um, it could easily be missed, actually, in just the busyness of transition and changing and day-to-day uh, -day life. So when I knew that I was teaching this week and I looked at the first two and I was like, oh man, really? Come on, let's, let's do like, turn all blames into one. We skip ahead to number 11. Um, but yeah, I think it's, Gosh, it's just so important and so meaningful to really give ourselves the time to reflect on these and, and for our loved ones, of course, and for ourselves. Okay, we're gonna move into the next two here, which also are kind of a couple. So the first one, gently closing our eyes. Recall that whatever you do, whether virtuous or not, has a result. What goes around comes around.
and considering this deeply at the levels of body, speech, and mind, not just action and behavior. Recall that whatever you do, whether virtuous or not, has a result. What goes around comes around. I find this one actually, it's a bit problematic. It's a bit challenging. Um, recall that whatever you do, virtuous or not, has a result. What goes around comes around. I think we could often, unfortunately, turn this on its head and feel that when bad things happen to us, it's our fault. Or that when bad things happen to others, it's their fault. So I think it's really important with this one to kind of be very precise in how we hold it, to look at it very clearly. I, I of course think it's, it's um, so useful for us to take responsibility for the impacts that we uh, intentionally and unintentionally are creating in the world around us. There is a philosopher by the name of Peter Singer, some of you may know, and he talks about acts of commission and acts of omission. So acts of commission are things that we do, that we deliberately do, and they create harm. And we have to take responsibility for that. But then there's acts of omission, things that when harm is occurring, we don't act. It's sobering. It's really <laughs> powerful to consider uh, the ways that we may be inadvertently contributing to harm, not through our direct action, but through our inaction. I think one benefit of this time of uprisings has been that that has come very clearly to many people for whom that wasn't clear before. I think it's interesting to also feel into how this relates to our Dharma practice directly. I often have heard my teachers say around ethics, which this is very much about ethics. If you sit down to practice and your mind is full of regret, guilt, jealousy, it's going to be very hard to settle into your body, speech, and mind. Very hard. Very hard. We can't actually progress very far with our practices if we are continually kind of polluting <laughs> our mind with unwholesome act, acts and behaviors, things that we do to ourselves or to others that kind of create this low level disturbance. So we're thinking about what we do and how it impacts ourselves and others and how it impacts our practice. Um, so I'd love to hear from other folks um, and feel free to um, unmute and share if you like. What, what does this, um, what does this one specifically be, uh, recall that whatever you do, whether virtuous or not, has a result? How does that land with you? I think we're getting slightly more into the confronting, I mean, 
death and dying is pretty confronting. This one, however, is also confronting in its own way. The law of karma. Yes, this is karma, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mace. It just makes me think a lot about, um, like, um, comfort, right? And like, um, it's comforting for me to have my cell phone. It's not like super healthy, but, um, and then like having a cell phone is harmful in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, like who is mining, there's some particular mineral, um, I don't remember what it's called, but it's not a happy mining situation. I don't know if any mining situation is happy. Um, and so like this particular slogan makes me think a little bit of the relationship between comfort and harm. And it also is, you know, like you said at the beginning about how it's really, this one is hard because we could just totally strangle ourselves on this one. It sometimes makes it feel like there's like nothing one can do. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also with what sort of like politically is going on in this country, I, I've heard so many people just being like, how did this happen? And then I think about this slogan and like, this has been centuries in the making. This moment has been centuries in the making, um, including what Walt put in the chat, which was like something like the path to evil. All you need for the path to evil is for good people to do nothing. Yes. Um, but then it also makes me think about, you know, that's because I'm so strong with the negativity bias. Like that's all true on the positive side too. Mm -hmm. You know, that the that the practice, the habit and practice of cultivating pro-social emotions and pro-social behaviors is also impactful. And that I more often dismiss that. Like yeah. it's never enough. It's not, you know, you could never do enough in this world of suffering, impossible. Like Avilo, Avilo needed, you know, a trillion arms. And probably really those thousand arms represent a trillion arms in my mind. You know, like he really had, or they really had a trillion arms. Um, so yeah, just kind of remembering that that there's bull. Yeah. there's bull, yeah. Yeah, thank you, yeah. And yeah, I, I completely skipped over the part where it says, whether virtuous or not, I just went to not. And I think that is a, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's, in, that's interesting. And really having the space to see, yeah, the wholesomeness that's created too, right? When you do sit down to practice and feel, um, you know, since we had this chapter um, by Sukhni Rinpoche on inner speed limit, I've been thinking about it a lot. And for those of you who weren't there, it's really around, we can move through the world efficiently, fast, but without being fast on the inside. And that that kind of subtle body level of presence can be so supportive for our practice. And Chandra at the end of that session said, part of decolonizing our experience of being human um, from a ideal of a culture that is fast. So part of our Dharma is actually figuring out what our own inner speed limit is. And, and that's been a, a wonderful reflection for me, something that has really been turning my mind. And I know that when I'm not moving through the world with the kind of conventional structures of fast, my practice benefits enormously. I still get a lot done, but not, um, yeah, just a different way. Um, I see from Gina, sometimes regret or guilt comes from the past. It's not that I'm polluting my mind, but more that things from my childhood uh, come in unbidden. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it isn't, um, right, of course, as children, 
we're primordially innocent. Um, and yet what happens to us is instantiated at such this deep level. Uh, we know that our, our childhood experiences have um, so many implications for how we relate to the world, to one another and our primary relationships. And they come up. And I think it's interesting because when uh, we think of um, whatever we do, that includes not just the memory, but how do we hold that memory when it comes? That's really our, um, then gets to be our responsibility. And if we try to suppress it and avoid it, do everything possible to run away from it, we will experience what happens as a result. And if we hold it and love it and treasure it and turn towards it, we will notice what happens as a result, right? So we kind of really do get an opportunity and I appreciate that clarification. It's not um, to say that if we've done something wrong ever, we'll never do good. And in some ways, you know, um, getting a little too lost in our guilt can prevent us from action. And it's in some ways, especially when things happen to us as a child, um, it's a really wonderful practice of helping um, disintegrate the idea that we have control, right? Of course we couldn't control it and we have so little control. Um, what we do matters, says Manuel, yes. And Jim says, nature doesn't hurry, but gets everything done. That's right, that's right. Okay, we're going to reflect on our last slogan. It's quite a mouthful, so I'm gonna give us a bit of time. I invite us once again to gently close our eyes, come inward. And maybe take a moment here as though we were cleansing the palate of our mind and heart and body to refresh ourselves with some breaths. Letting our attention follow the breath in and follow the breath out. Reconnecting to the body, the breath, this present moment. Contemplate that as long as you are too focused on self-importance and too caught up in thinking about how you are good or bad, you will suffer. Obsessing about getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want does not result in happiness. So just taking a moment to notice how those words land, how they feel in the body, what they stir in the mind. Contemplate that as long as you are too focused on self-importance and too caught up in thinking about how you are good or bad, you will suffer obsessing about getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want does not result in happiness.
contemplate that as long as you are too focused on self-importance and too caught up in thinking about how you are good or bad, you will suffer. Obsessing about getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want does not result in happiness. So the preliminaries, impermanence, karma, and then samsara, <laughs> right? Just really contemplate that every day. That's what these are for. As long as you're focused on self-importance and caught up in how good you are or how bad you are, you will suffer. Obsessing about getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want does not result in happiness. Why isn't this taught in kindergarten? Maybe it is now, I hope, or some version of that. Anyone reflections on, on that? Those, the least pithy, but still quite pithy of these preliminary slogans. I, I love how it builds from, from the previous one, right? We were talking about the consequences of our actions, if they're good or, or bad actions. And then we're saying that if you dwell too much on the consequences of your actions, uh, you'll bring suffering. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, seeing. And what's so beautiful about the seven points is they are developmental. They build us up, right? So that's what's so nice about using them in order. And, um, you know, it's so interesting because I think that self-importance aspect, which is very common in modern culture, um, it, it almost goes hand in hand with that inability to take responsibility or to see that we are in some ways reaping what we sow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I've been, um, you know, I think it's, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go out on a limb here, but um, I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about our disconnection from the planet and from our understanding of ecology and how we are part of nature. Um, and it, it definitely feels as though when we're focused on ourselves, we are focused on ourselves as separate, not only from one another, but from this amazing, living um, system that we're part of and it just god it makes us so unhappy 
Um, Diane says, I, I seem to have a built-in process of self-cherishing and ego maintenance that is a source of my suffering, preferences and disconnection. Uh, Dharma is the antidote. Thank you for your brave confession, Diane. Wonderful. Yes, many of us. And yeah, it is. It's, it's, um, it's, it does require um, such a lot of self-examination for that to not be habit. I think there's, it's so built into us, unfortunately, many of us from an early age of um, really um, whatever you do makes you good. So you should be good and do more and, um, or do, you know, whatever, impress. And yeah, it gets, it's such a trap. Um, the self-cherishing then vacillating to um, self-condemnation, um, which is just also, we hold so tightly to our self-criticisms. I'm so bad, God, I'm just so terrible. And don't see that, you know, not only, it's just the other side. And of course, creates so much suffering. And it makes us unavailable to others. Um, and this is, I would say, uh, in, our, in a, a lot of the current um, discourse around uprisings, sometimes you hear people talk about white fragility. And, you know, the obstacle of that is when people start to come aware to their privilege, they feel so overwhelmed by guilt, um, it becomes self-involved. And they can no longer actually address the suffering that is being presented. And so again, this kind of self-absorption in our own suffering, in our own badness, in our own goodness, it actually separates us from both relative and ultimate bodhicitta. Separates us from being able to really fulfill that natural capacity we have to be of service and compassionate. And when you, know, you read about the lojon, you read about it as a tool for bodhicitta, as a tool to open and sustain the heart. And um, so these, these slogans aren't there to just tear us down and, you know, lay us bare and leave us on the side of the road. They're there to take away all the obscurations between us and our most beautiful Buddha nature, uh, our compassion, our kindness, our natural desire, whether you want to call it our neurobiological imperative for care or our Buddha nature, um, it's pointing to the same thing. Quite beautiful. Um, someone asks, is this the lesson of emptiness and no self? Heidi, you're on the right track. That comes, there's a whole bunch of lojong um, that really helps us point out kind of the formless nature of a lot. In fact, uh, yes, I think we'll have time to do just one from the second point uh, of mind training in which we really start the practices um, of no self and otherwise. Any other thoughts? or comments on this one. It's, again, quite provocative. It can be quite challenging. This is a hard one to, if you're not already interested in the Dharma, get people excited about. This is like, you know, I love teaching in a meditation context because I can just wave my full devotion flag. Um, this is a harder one to really encourage people and get them excited about. And, you know, I think it's um, easier to use terms or ideas like hedonic treadmill and hedonic adaptation. And some of you may be familiar with these terms and what they point out to is that there is, um, as the Buddha said, uh, an end to gratification. And we can actually see gratification to its end. Meaning we, you know, arguably, right? How much pizza can we eat till the pizza is no longer tasty and actually makes us want to maybe throw up? Uh, how much is anything from the outside that we love and cherish? How long do we love and cherish it, right? So, gosh, I, you know, I'll be happy when I get, um, a new, um, for, my, for me in my example, a new uh, hot water kettle, because mine takes so long. It's like eight minutes until I can have a cup of tea. God, 
But when I have that new, new water kettle, the Zoji Rushi, and I just press it in the hot water at the perfect temperature, I'm going to be so happy. And then what we find, of course, is that, yeah, I'll probably be happy for a couple of days. And then uh, because it's hedonic, meaning it's something that brings me stimulus-driven pleasure from the outside, I'll get used to it. I'll adapt. And then I'm looking for the next thing. So our hedonic adaptation, meaning our ability to quickly take for granted and no longer notice the goodness of something, becomes a treadmill that we always need to keep going. So you see that being described in more contemporary psychological terms. And you know we also do see that this kind of um, aspect of <laughs> self-focus <laughs> often leads to negative rumination, right? Um, and self-focus can also lead to nar uh, narcissistic preoccupation. So whether your preoccupation is how bad you are or how good you are, you will find both of those listed as clinical disorders. And um, I don't think we need to be at the level of getting a clinical diagnosis to see that so much self-importance, it's just hard to sustain. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have ever <clears throat> encountered this experience. Occasionally in some of my more, um, some, some, I don't know if you guys have this experience yourself, but sometimes the Dharma actually really truly enters a moment in your life and you see reality just as it is. And you're like, whoa, this is a crazy show we're all involved in. What is going on here? It's as though, you know, all of the things in the world, you can see them just, you can see through them. And it's, it's actually quite startling. This has often happened to me after coming off long-term retreat or a longer retreat. And the world and all of its movements, all of its kind of energy and systems just feels so silly and, and so thin. Um, and it's, it's kind of profound. And you realize it is as though everybody is acting on a stage. Um, and that's, uh, it's a powerful and can be a bit of a startling insight to have in the moment uh, of practice or in the moment of um, entering it into the world. Any other thoughts on this one? Oh, I see Walt says, is there a trap in this suffering is the ripening of my karma? <laughs> so I should wallow in it. Yeah, yeah. I will quote the great Dakini, uh, my teacher, Jennifer Wellwood, who says, grieve your losses fully, but don't stay there. Right. There's, so there, there is often a ripening of our karma. There is our losses to grieve, um, but we can't make our home there. Um, our, our wallowing, just as our narcissism, just as our preoccupation with how bad we are, it separates us from others. And I think that's always the, the kind of North Star. Is this separating me from my ability to show up fully with compassion? And Claudia says, Looking back at challenges in my life, I realized that suffering has made me more resilient and I've learned from my mistakes. So I guess accept life as it comes. The tools um, that we're learning here help us face these challenges better. Yes, Claudia. And you know, I, probably the most well-known of the Lojong slogans is turn all adversity into the path. And if you had to have like a headline for Lojong, that would probably be it. Many of these are for exactly that purpose. Um, Jim says, love your life, but don't love it too much. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Mary Oliver. Um, okay. This is such a nice one to close on. So we're gonna do one more reflection, squeezing it in. So please, closing your eyes, we're moving on to point two, which is beginning our training in bodhicitta in our awakened heart. Regard all dharmas as dreams. Whatever you experience in your life, pain, pleasure, heat or cold or anything else is like something happening in a dream, like a memory you are evoking.
regard all dharmas as dreams. This one too is, is a bit complicated and can feel as though we're saying nothing matters. It's actually an invitation for us to start moving into bringing emptiness into our view. And it invites us to really see that our dreams actually feel quite real, even though they're a projection, right? Even though when we're in a dream experience, unless you're lucid dreaming, what's happening feels real. The pain, the hurt, the sadness. And only because our, our luckily, <laughs> our bodies don't move in our sleep is it any different, actually, at a physiological level, what's happening to us. And for most, for many of us, a lot of the worst pain and suffering we experience is what we're projecting not what's there. A funny quote by Mark Twain is, the worst things in my life never actually happened to me. Right, this idea of what's gonna to happen to us in our life is just so oppressive and we can lose and waste so much time there. And so to regard, especially, right, like we don't regard the loss of a loved one as a dream, it, it happened, it's real. The pain and the loss is real. And yet holding on to it as this is the only real. This is actually the only thing that matters. It should matter to everyone. It'll matter for me forever in just this way. That's how we get fixed. That's how we get stuck. And so this practice of regarding it as a dream, in my interpretation, isn't that we become passive. It's that we just start to realize and kind of poke some ventilation holes into, especially the densest of our experiences. And we see that they will shift and change. Just as a dream that feels so real will shift and change when we wake up. I really, um, yeah, I think it's such an interesting idea that whatever you experience in your life, pain or pleasure, heat, cold, or anything else is like something happening in a dream, like a memory you are evoking. So provocative, so provocative. So for the next week, I invite us all to really consider these preliminaries, maintaining an awareness of the preciousness of human life, be aware of the reality that life ends and impermanence comes for everyone. Recall that whatever you do, whether virtuous or not, has a result. What goes around comes around. Contemplate that as long as you are too focused on self-importance, too caught up in thinking about how you are good or bad, you will suffer. And regarding all dharma as dreams, um, there is a uh, online copy um, of the 59 slogans with a little bit of commentary by Pema Chodron and that's free um, on Lion's Roar. I think it's a nice version. There's books with much commentary by many, many great teachers, Chogyam Trungpa among them, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, and yeah, really look forward to moving through these. Um, so let us dedicate our time here together. 
one more instance of just coming, coming back together, gathering our breath, and maybe recalling your intention that you set at the beginning of the night. And taking a moment to consider that if there's any benefit that we have collectively generated in coming together with the Dharma and these teachings and beginning to transform our mind with these preliminaries. May this time together be of most benefit, really extending out through our hearts and minds so that all beings would know belonging all beings would feel safe so that each and every being would have the preciousness of human life granted to them. Thanks all. I realized I don't think we did uh, announcements at the beginning. Sorry about that, Katie. That was me just launching into uh, the welcoming. Hi, everyone. I'm going to do the announcements tonight. Um, I'm Mason, a total happy part of this collective. And um, I just want to remind people that even though we're in the virtual world, um, the donations that we give help support our teachers and our Zoom platform, and there is some possible ponderings of a physical space sometime in the future um, when that would be a possibility again. So um, <clears throat> it's just really a blessing to be able to support this um, organization. And then I also want to let folks know that on Tuesday nights, the Dharma Collective lost, launched a series a couple weeks ago called Wise Action. It's, it's about like dealing with these very particularly difficult times and it's a different teacher every Tuesday night. And um, it's really pretty juicy and delicious. There's some recordings up on the, U, the YouTube channel or on the website, YouTube channel. Yeah, so check out the Dharma Collective YouTube channel. And this Tuesday is a teacher who I think is fairly regular, Mimi, and I don't know her last name. Um, and she's going to be talking about the non-binary nature of understanding, I guess, the world as it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, or that, um, and it's just, it's a really great um, focused time. And then, as you all know, there's just tons of stuff on the calendar upcoming. Yeah, and we love you and we want lots of you yeah, and we're happy that everybody's here i think that's it <laughs>